I um, would like to say that uh, Paul has moved on after Berkeley to go to uh, the University of Southern California Institute of uh, Creative Technologies and is the Associate Director of Graphics Research over there, involved with uh, photorealistic um, um, rendering and, uh, and environments, and, uh, and more recently, virtual actors. He was the uh, Computer Animation Festival um, Chair for SIGGRAPH 2007, and uh, is now here over at Google to tell us about his latest work. So uh, without further ado, Paul DeBevick. Thank you very much, Ken. All right. Hey, thanks, folks. So it's very exciting to be here. And uh, another reason that I'm up here in the Bay Area is we've been doing a couple of screenings of the uh, Computer Animation Festival, the electronic theater for uh, SIGGRAPH. This is the show that originally premiered in uh, San Diego. And uh, there's going to be a showing tonight if you are a fan of computer graphics or know any friends uh, who might be. Uh, at uh, San Francisco State University. If you just go to the San Francisco SIGGRAPH uh, website, sfsig.org, uh, I think the show starts at 7.30, and it's going to have Sony SXRD 4K projection off of our HD Cam SR master tape, and is going to look absolutely uh, gorgeous. So if you want to see a very uh, faithful rendition of the SIGGRAPH Computer Animation Festival, the best computer animations uh, over the last year, uh, that's a great opportunity uh, to check it out. So what I brought to talk about is uh, some of the computer graphics work that we've been uh, doing um, at uh, the, my group at the Institute for Creative Technologies, uh, kind of a sampling of a couple of recent uh, projects. And kind of to motivate sort of how we got here, I have a little bit of some more historical uh, material. Um, the take on computer graphics that my group has mostly been involved in uh, has been uh, graphics that tries to make a lot of use of images. And um, when I was doing my PhD at Berkeley, I got interested in trying to do pretty realistic renditions of things like the Berkeley campus. And it seemed like photographs were a good way to do that. Um, a, uh, I was uh, very uh, lucky to be uh, helped out by a um, professor there, Chris Benton, uh, who did kite aerial photography. And uh, eventually, when we got our kite off the ground, we were able to take some aerial photographs of the uh, Berkeley campus. Um, and uh, in particular of the Berkeley Campanile, which I thought would be a good focal point for some image-based modeling and rendering of this. And I also got to climb up in the uh, lantern there uh, and take some photographs of the campus all the way around uh, as well. And these photographs you can see here. Um, we also found a couple of uh, photographs from an aerial mapping survey, so we had some parallax from away from uh, the top of the uh, tower. And then using a um, system that I developed with C.J. Taylor and my uh, advisor, uh, Jatender Malik, we were able to build uh, interactively, uh, in not too much effort, um, a three-dimensional model of the campus from these uh, 20 photographs here. Uh, it's not a uh, terribly detailed model. It's kind of a lot of you know, boxy buildings, maybe with a roof on them. The Campanile is by far our uh, best model. Um, but the idea, of course, is that we're not going to look at them this way. We're going to look at them with textures applied to them and projected on. So if we take that uh, geometry-based model, put the texture maps on there, maybe do a little view-dependent texture mapping, depending on where you're looking at it from, uh, it all of a sudden became a really exciting uh, thing for us to take a look at, because it looked really real. We had no idea how we could have made this model look as realistic uh, any other way. And since I was careful enough to take all the photos in the same lighting conditions, we sort of are reproducing the appearance of the reflectance properties of all of the surfaces relatively realistically, uh, and the light transport, uh, how the light bounce between all of the surfaces is uh, uh, replicated there. And uh, I think somebody over here on the left was uh, pointing out maybe like a hole filling algorithm artifact that you, uh, that, that you can see. So anyway, there's plenty of little artifacts all around. But it was real enough that, at least back then, we could uh, believe we were really flying around the campus. And uh, I had the chance to make a short film. This is a clip from it uh, that took some real video of campus as well. This is me standing on top of the Campanile and doing a little match move shot um, back to kind of a fly around here. Um, in order to um, create a, uh, a virtual uh, fly around um, of the uh, campus. So 
Uh, when I uh, have a chance to play around with uh, Google Earth, I really love uh, seeing that a lot of these same kind of effects are here, and they're right there on software that everybody uh, has. And uh, the idea of that continuing to the point where everything in Google Earth you know, looks every bit as photoreal as this does right here, I think is a really amazing uh, vision for the future. And obviously, Google is in the front seat for doing that. Um, so this was an exciting project. It had some applications in the uh, movie industry as well for kind of like doing virtual backgrounds and reconstructing various kinds of sets for virtual cinematography. Um, uh, what I got interested in after that was trying to reconstruct other kinds of environments. So like another um, place that I tried to do a reconstruction of was uh, the interior of St. Peter's Basilica. And um, the idea was we tried to do a little dynamic simulation of some objects uh, that would be there in the, uh, in the basilica. And I got interested in trying to record real world illumination conditions so I could illuminate new objects to insert into these image-based modeled scenes. So this is a scene from a, a film we did for the SIRGRAPH 99 electronic theater where uh, the interior of St. Peter's was modeled from basically two panoramas, one in the nave, one near the altar here, some rough geometry built with the facade system to project onto, and then using high dynamic range imagery to record the range of light that was in there, and then illuminate these new computer generated objects with the light that was actually there. And the way that that technology really works is that um, you would uh, basically try to use one of the several available techniques for taking an omnidirectional photograph. And one of the uh, ones that was particularly successful in the early days is something that was originally used for purposes of environment mapping, which is to take a photograph of a mirrored ball, which, as it turns out, gives you a view of the entire scene all around. Uh, if you shoot that as a series of exposures from underexposed images that can see into the bright areas of the scene, like uh, the sky and like the, um, uh, you know, any direct light sources that you would have, to longer exposure photographs that can see the indirect light coming from the ground and the trees, any shadow detail if you happen to want that, then you've really scientifically recorded the full range of illumination. And we have some algorithms that'll put that together into an image that has pixel values that go not zero to 255, but zero to whatever they need to go to, 100,000, a million. And if you then hook these into a good um, uh, computer graphics rendering algorithm, such as at the time we used Greg Ward's radiant system, we could take these image-based lighting environments, wrap them around a CG scene, and then illuminate those objects with that illumination and get relatively realistic renderings of things that otherwise might just look like very computer-generated objects. So these are uh, just a very simple scene that I modeled in Emacs, illuminated by a couple of different kinds of illumination environments that we took. So this is, uh, I think, Funston Beach, uh, just a little bit uh, north of here. This is the Eucalyptus Grove at Berkeley. Uh, this is Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, which is one of the prettiest illumination environments we ever had a chance. And this is uh, the Galleria delle Uffizi, uh, which is from uh, the, one of the middle scenes in Fiat Lux. So these um, images of these lighting environments are posted on our website, and every so often, um, uh, rather frequently actually, people use them to do some of their own renderings. And I get to see things like this um, you know, very realistically rendered uh, amplifier that a fellow in France did. It's illuminated by the light of my kitchen when I was living in Berkeley, because I posted this on here. And uh, I've seen quite a number of objects strangely rendered into my uh, kitchen, which is a cool thing. Um, even more fun is um, occasionally you see someone who's gone out and shot their own light probes for their own crazy little idea. And this is a series of light probes that surfaced uh, on the internet a while ago, uh, shot by a, a young fellow, 17-year-old uh, fellow at the time named Nick Bertke, who um, uh, went around his parents' house had an inexpensive Canon PowerShot G2 camera uh, and shot a high dynamic range image series of this uh, mirrored sphere. This is a um, uh, showing that you know this is bright enough that you can see the indirect light coming from the walls and the floor. Uh, the light from the windows is totally blown out, so you wouldn't be able to accurately light objects using that as your record of illumination. But he shot it with these bracketed exposures, and as you get to shorter and shorter exposures, you can actually finally see correctly. Uh, within range of the sensor, what the illumination was, you know, the blue uh, light from the sky and some of the other less blue light that's bouncing off of the concrete outside. And what he wanted to do with this, he had a little idea. He was a fan of the game Half-Life 2, and he knew how to hack the game so you can output the character models and then load them up into your own modeling software. And he had the idea that he'd make some of these Half-Life 2 characters basically come and visit him uh, at his parents' house. And he had uh, uh, quite a bit of luck with that. 
So here, these characters are added into some background plate photography uh, of the scene, and they're lit by the light that was actually there uh, at the time. So with relatively little effort, he could make it look like these guys were kind of hanging out and uh, spending the day uh, with him there. Um, he's just getting kind of comfortable in the couch here. Uh, and then maybe they stayed, stayed a while and watched some TV later, and uh, <laughs> here he is. And the exciting thing about this is that um, you know, you can see kind of like a little bit of the light from the TV on this coffee cup, which I think was actually there, and then that's completely consistent with the light that you see on the character. And also all the indirect illumination and the soft shadowing that you get from the characters is basically consistent. So what he's able to do is take this crazy idea he had in his head and communicate it visually in a way that the first thing that you see in the image is not whether it looks real or not, but it's the idea that he was trying to communicate. Uh, and that's really, you know, the most exciting thing I see when some of these technologies uh, get used for creative purposes. And, uh, and this technique has also been used quite a bit uh, for feature film production. The Academy Award winning visual effects film, The Golden Compass, uh, done by Mike Fink and his team this year, used extensive image-based lighting techniques to render uh, folks like the digital animals and the polar bears and such. And with their great artistry, they got some amazing results with that as well. So one of the things that you need to create really compelling computer graphics is you need to be able to render people. And there's been a lot of exciting work over the years recently uh, in the area of digital people. And some of our work has actually played into some of that as well. Uh, the first projects we got interested in in rendering people uh, was actually the last project I did at UC Berkeley uh, in 2000 before I went down uh, to the uh, Institute for Creative Technologies. And we built this device called Light Stage One which had the goal of basically taking a data set of how a person's face looks lit from light coming from every direction that light can come from. And with this uh, set of you know, plastic pipes and wood that we got at Home Depot over the course of about 10 visits as we figured out how to build this thing, uh, we could rotate this light in a spiral. It took about a minute to go from top to bottom, but we would get a data set that would show the person's face lit from all of these different uh, illumination directions. We just record it live to a mini DV camera uh, and then pull the footage off of that. Um, we see the face lit from the front, the sides, above and below, and even from behind. As it turns out, lighting objects from close to behind is also really important because you get these kind of rim lighting effects that cinematographers like to exploit when they're lighting their real characters. And the idea was, let's take this face and try to light it with one of our light probe images that we got, like the Grace Cathedral light probe. So what would it take to illuminate this face with this illumination environment? Well, as it turns out, there's actually a very straightforward way to do it, which is that if you take this image here, it's an omnidirectional image, you can resample it to a different um, coordinate mapping here. Uh, this here is like a latitude-longitude uh, mapping. And essentially, if you multiply this data set by this data set, they're in the same coordinate space, they're sampled the same way now, you actually end up lighting the face with that lighting environment one piece of the environment at a time. So these images of the face here are now bright and yellow because there was bright yellow light coming from the corresponding directions in the environment. These images here are bright and kind of a cool color because there's bright, cool illumination coming from the stained glass windows above. And all these other images of the face here are sort of dim browns and yellows and purples because those are the different colors of the indirect illumination bouncing up from the floor and coming in from the walls onto this fellow here. So now that we've illuminated his face by that environment one little piece at a time, we can just take advantage of the linearity of light and the superposition principle and simulate him lit by the entire environment at the same time just by adding all of those images together. And the result is that you get an image of his face lit by that lighting environment uh, without him ever having to go over to Grace Cathedral and actually get lit by the light. And it gets nice things like you know the yellow kind of rim lighting effect here from the uh, light bouncing off the altar. You can see the stained glass windows reflecting in his forehead and in his hair. Um, you get all the right effects of how light um, hits skin and uh, is able to um, uh, and is able to uh, have you know, a specular component, a diffuse component, subsurface scattering, self-shadowing into reflections. And that's just because it's all there in the original data that you, uh, that you captured. So let's see here. So we're going to go through a couple of slides here that uh, we're not going to be able to put on the webcast. Uh, but I wanted to talk about uh, a chance that we had where we got to work with Sony Pictures Imageworks to apply this kind of technique to some of their digital stunt double characters for a couple of films uh, that they did. Basically, um, through a collaborator on our first project named Mark Sagar, 
uh, who worked on a, um, uh, went to work at Sony Imageworks sometime after this, and then also uh, a visual effects supervisor, Scott Stockdyke, who'd seen our SIGGRAPH paper, they thought this could be a good way to get uh, realistic skin reflectance for some digital actors that they wanted to shoot, first of all for the movie Spider-Man 2. So uh, starting in about late 2002, early 2003, we did some tests, and then they brought over uh, a couple of the actors from the film. This is Alfred Molina, who played uh, Doc Ock in the movie. And we captured a data set on film of him in one of our new light stages. This is light stage two. And um, it had uh, strobe lights, kind of a semicircle of strobe lights that go around. So this is actually a long exposure photograph that makes it look like there's a whole sphere of light around him, but it's actually just a semicircle of lights. We captured that kind of data, and then what we did uh, for this is we had a rough kind of cyberware scan, 3D geometry of the face, and we projected these images from the sides, from the front, as basically relightable texture maps that you could then put on the 3D geometry and then get a relatively realistic rendering of the face lit by any kind of illumination environment that you want. We had to be a little bit careful to kind of separate the specular reflection of the face from the subsurface scattering component of the face because when you change your viewpoint around, the specular reflection actually needs to shift around according to the surface normals in your viewpoint. So we actually did a color-based separation of those and then resynthesized the specular component according to the new viewpoints so that it would shift around on the digital character. It wouldn't just seem plastered onto the face. Uh, but it was relatively successful for them. They were able to use it in about 40 shots of the film uh, for a totally digital uh, Doc Ock character for all of the skin. They augmented it with uh, traditional computer graphics with some nice cloth simulations for the rest of the body. Uh, they added uh, you know, digital sunglasses, so they had to figure out how to make the um, light interact with a computer-generated object that's close to one of these image-based uh, objects. Uh, and they had a full-screen digital close-up uh, for his uh, death scene when he's floating back in the water that they thought would be a little dangerous to film for real. And we also uh, shot Tobey Maguire for a couple scenes where he has to stop a, uh, a train and has his uh, mask off there. Uh, more recently, we got to work with this fellow here who played the new Superman in the Superman movie that came out in 2006. And uh, with this, they scanned the film at higher resolution. They had the pipeline uh, more refined, and they were able to get some even better results. So when he needs to throw the space shuttle back into space, that's a, a digital Superman looking at the scene there. Um, there's a scene toward the end of the movie where things have worked out reasonably well. And uh, he's pretty satisfied, so he has kind of a nice satisfied expression flying around Metropolis. Um, in this case here, they actually started with a neutral scan of his face and then animated it using their animation system to kind of put a little bit of a, of a pleasant expression on there. And that works pretty well. If you needed to really act and talk and go into extreme expressions, that's not going to work as well because it's too far away from a neutral pose to look quite as realistic. So some of the work we're doing now is actually looking at trying to capture these data sets live of people in different expressions and positions. Um, there's also one shot where they came up really, really close to him. He's out in space. He's thinking really hard. We have to dramatize this, and so the camera flies in really close to, he's probably thinking right about over in this area here. Uh, and um, they, because it's an image-based data set, they can you know, design the lighting to have you know, a little bit of a rim light here and a little bit of warm light coming from below. I'm not sure where that is from outer space, but it's somewhere at this point. And um, you can see they really can get a lot of skin detail and a lot of nice uh, skin reflectance effects that would otherwise be kind of difficult. So um, we've had a chance to continue working on this on the research side. And one of the devices here, which we can totally put on our uh, web presentation, is Light Stage 6, um, which was an idea to try to extend the Light Stage idea from just capturing faces to capturing the whole uh, human body. And, um, one of the reasons this actually happened is that my institute had some extra space in a uh, uh, satellite facility uh, that uh, they had to find something to, to do with. And they said, hey, Paul, you were always kind of talking about building that big light stage. Well, as it turns out, this could actually be a useful thing for us, because then we've got a good, valid project to do with the rest of this space. So at that point, we had to figure out how to turn the various talk that we had into a realizable plan. And pretty soon, we had a Maya model that looked like this. Uh, which was a somewhat daunting thing to put together for just one research group. But uh, we were lucky that a fellow named uh, Sebastian Sylvan, uh, who's now at Autodesk, um, had uh, been a, a head of a virtual stage facility in uh, Italy, had wanted to work with us, knew actually how to get bigger projects together and make bigger things uh, happen. So I worked with him very closely to uh, actually get the design here. He found all the places that could source all the parts. And within about two months and a little bit of uh, sore shoulders, we were able to put together Light Stage 6. And 
the idea of light stage six being an entire sphere of lights is that we wanted to very rapidly be able to capture these data sets. We wanted to very quickly go from being able to light somebody from uh, this direction of light to this direction of light and capture this kind of image-based relighting data set in real time. Now, if we have some luck here, this video will play. And we'll see here. No, I'm going to pop out of the program and play it from here. And um, what we've um, uh, got is one um, initial project where we actually were capturing what amounts to uh, seven dimensional data sets of um, people going through natural motions. So this here is uh, Bruce Lamond, uh, one of our researchers in our laboratory. We have him on a treadmill here. Um, he normally is a relatively serious fellow and looks like he's concentrating. Here he's concentrating a little harder than usual because he's trying not to fall off of this treadmill. Um, he's actually paying attention to uh, some grooves that we cut underneath the treadmill belt so we can feel where he is left and right and forward back. Uh, but the idea is that if we spun him around for about um, 45 seconds and shot him with high-speed cameras under time-multiplexed illumination, we would get a data set of him under all lighting conditions. So if we see him uh, in slow motion, we're going to slow this video down. You can see that what's really happening is we're very rapidly going from one lighting direction uh, to another, sometimes it's dark, to another, to another, and we're interleaving all of these data sets at frame rate of the camera. We're actually, in this experiment, capturing 33 different lighting conditions every 30th of a second. And over a 30th of a second, these are all these lighting conditions here of, uh, of Bruce. Um, and uh, from that kind of data, we can use that image-based relighting process to show him under kind of any kind of illumination. Um, and the reason that we have him spinning around on the treadmill, if we skip forward, you can see we actually got him from all different angles as well, uh, is so that we could also have virtual control of his viewpoint. So we had our high-speed camera here at about chest level. And then from a little bit above, we had a borrowed uh, high-speed camera, courtesy of Vision Research. And then from floor level, we had another borrowed high-speed camera. So we really had three cameras. And the idea was we'll just have him repeat his motion 36 times as we rotate him 10 degrees over the course of each one of those. And we'd effectively get this 3 by 36 light field of Bruce, uh, also for every frame of his animation and for every one of these illumination conditions. Now, we wanted to eventually take Bruce out of the light stage and then make it look like he's running across some place that he's never been to, uh, complete control of viewpoint and illumination. And part of what we would need for that is to get a alpha channel or a, a mat uh, for him. So one of our lighting conditions, we turn off all the light on Bruce, and we just turn on lights on this piece of gray paper that's behind him, and that gives us this silhouette. And that's exactly the right image that you need if you want to composite him out of that environment and then into another environment. Uh, the problem was, in this case here, um, that didn't give us a good mat for his feet. And we couldn't really think of a way to take this you know, treadmill that we'd found at the local sports chalet and get it to uh, you know, glow brightly um, uh, for a thirtieth of a, or for a thousandth of a second, 30 times per second. Uh, and so what we used for that is we actually covered uh, the entire uh, turntable and the belt of the treadmill with retroreflective cloth and then put some uh, ring lights around the camera that were also time multiplexed in. So when we're shooting the matte frames, that actually glows back toward the, the camera as well, and then we get a good matte for the entire body at that point. So going back to the relighting idea, here's Bruce walking forward in the stage, but we can relight it to show him lit from you know, any direction that we want, or we can play that image-based relighting trick and show him under the light of Grace Cathedral or the Uffizi Gallery. And if we want to change the viewpoint, then essentially what we're going to do is morph between the different viewpoints that we have. We run optical flow between adjacent viewpoints. Uh, and then we actually combine the idea of view interpolation, which is one of the inventions that uh, Lance Williams made at uh, uh, Apple back in 1993, a very important paper, with another very important idea, which is the light field concept, which was developed at Stanford in 1996 and also some researchers at Microsoft Research contemporaneously. Uh, and if we basically combine the idea of view interpolation with light fields such that the light field quadrilinear interpolation coefficients are also used to change the displacement vectors that we get uh, between as we morph from one view to another, then we can actually put both of these things together and then smoothly, from a relatively sparsely sampled light field, uh, actually generate views that are further away than we originally captured, closer in than we originally captured, and then any direction all the way around. 
So this is a, actually real-time rendering on an NVIDIA uh, card, a demo done by Charles Felix Chabert uh, in our group, um, kind of pushing into the scene and then doing a slow rotation around it. So finally, onto our problem. Here is a location that we thought it would be cool to watch Bruce running through. Uh, I shot it as a high dynamic range, uh, omnidirectional image, this time actually using a, a Canon still camera and fisheye lenses in a couple of different directions. Uh, put that back together into this high dynamic range lighting environment. And then we're going to drop Bruce into this scene. And we'll see the result. It's one of the first results we got with the technique. And here he is. So what we did is I animated kind of a camera pan across the scene. We're matching the viewpoint on Bruce as the camera pans across. And we've also illuminated him with the light from that environment. So hopefully it looks like you know, the color balance and the light directions are about correct. We have simultaneous questions from Ken and Lance here. Let's see if it's the same question. What do we have? Shadows. Shadows, very good. And Lance? What? Motion blur, okay, <laughs> different questions, both very good. Um, let's see here, on shadows, I'll show you in a second what we did with that. For motion blur, we did not add motion blur to the scene. In some of our earlier uh, facial time multiplexed illumination, we actually did use the optical flow vectors to resynthesize the appropriate 180 degree shutter uh, motion blur. We just didn't do that be for this project because we were, doing, um, we were using an, an NVIDIA card to do the rendering and we're trying to make it more real time uh, for that. But we did get some very nice results in some of the, the facial work that we've got. The shadows, if we go a little bit further, he is actually casting a soft shadow. He also has a friend over here, just to prove that this is all virtual. Uh, and the shadows here, they're not um, terribly high resolution shadows, but what we, we did is we actually used the silhouettes that we got from all around to carve out a basic volume of him, which otherwise is the first use of any notion of his geometry that we have in any of these renderings. But we get a basic kind of voxel model of him going along, and then we use that to um, cast rays from all of our basis lighting directions to figure out a shadow map that you would get from each basis illumination condition. And then we essentially do an image-based relighting combination of those shadow maps to figure out how much light would be blocked in one direction versus the other. So you actually get kind of a warm colored shadow when you're blocking the skylight, and you get a cool colored shadow when you're blocking the indirect light uh, from the uh, warm colored building that's behind us. And thinking that uh, you can't have too much of a good thing, we put a couple of bruises together here. They're not actually inter-reflecting the light of each other or self-shadowing each other. That's kind of future work at this point. But uh, uh, this, was, this was enough to at least amuse Bruce quite a bit. And he actually did all the work on the uh, uh, compositing and the, um, uh, the uh, mat finding there. This is a reverse time lapse of building our uh, light stage over a course of four days. There we go. All right, so let's go back to some slides here. And uh, what I want to talk about is a more recent project that we've done uh, that's face-related uh, face that um, was uh, inspired a little bit by a completely different kind of facial rendering pipeline uh, that has also uh, shown a lot of promise, which is the um, uh, idea of if you're going to try to do a digital model of an actor, maybe the first thing you should do is take a life cast of the actor's face in plaster uh, and then get that scanned, since now it doesn't move and it's diffuse, it's a good surface to digitize, uh, you can do that at very, very high resolution. Um, this is uh, something that's commonly done, um, and there's a company, XYZ RGB, uh, that uh, does this really, really amazingly well. Uh, there was a digital face rendering project that Lance Williams was involved in um, that was a test at Disney, uh, I think in like 2000 or, or, or so you're working on this, uh, when um, uh, they actually did what the first time that this really high resolution face uh, casting process was applied to creating a digital actor, and they got some amazing results with that. Uh, the standard problem here is that it's pretty much not good for getting like, you know, a live performance of an actor since it requires taking the cast and such. There's a bit of inconvenience involved. Uh, some people uh, say that it kind of changes the shape of the face a little bit. And the other problem is you don't easily get aligned texture maps uh, for the face. So you might ask, why not just, you know, scan the face itself at really high resolution? Maybe you can do a really fast laser scanner uh, for that. And one of the problems associated with uh, that is the fact that skin is not as nice a surface to scan as gray plaster. Um, the problem is, of course, subsurface scattering. And so if you have a little laser line on a piece of paper, it might give you a nice sharp uh, line. But once it actually hits skin, it's going to diffuse out and get blurry. So if you're trying to measure the geometry of the fine scale skin wrinkling and such based off of that blurry line, you're going to have some trouble. 
Uh, now, as it turns out, there actually is some light that reflects off of skin that does not get affected by subsurface scattering, and that is the specular reflection of the skin. And this is an image uh, that we found. Uh, this is actress Hilary Swank. It's not an attractively lit image because it's flashed right from the front, but it demonstrates this uh, point where if you can see in her specular reflection of the light, uh, that's where you can actually see the skin detail of the shape of the pores and the fine wrinkles. And assumably, on her forehead, next to where the specular reflection is, assumably she has a similar kind of skin texture right there, but you don't see it at all. That's because that is the subsurface scattering and it blurs it all out. It's in the specular reflection that you see this. And in fact, it's because you see it in specular reflections that it's actually important for rendering digital characters. If we didn't have any specular reflection, you'd never see this effect. You could probably get away without modeling it. But if you want to try to get that uh, realistic skin look in the specularities, you need to get that kind of geometry. So our idea was maybe there's a way that we can photograph just the specular reflection of somebody's face and then figure out the detailed shape of the face just from that. And we thought back to some of the work we did for our first light stage paper, where we had done a little experiment uh, using cross-polarization to remove specular reflections for someone's face. This is uh, Holly Kim, who is one of our uh, undergrad students working with us at the time. Uh, and she's lit by a single light and photographed by a camera right in front of her. Uh, you can see that we've got both a specular reflection and the subsurface reflection of the face here. As it turns out, if you put linear polarizers on both the camera, uh, both the light source and the camera, and if they're at opposite angles, the specular reflection maintains the polarization of the light, and so it can't make it through that second polarizer, and it doesn't show up in the photograph. So this is a cross-polarized image of Holly without any specular reflection. The subsurface light, since it actually gets underneath the surface, scatters around a couple times, it gets depolarized, and about half of it will make it through that second polarizer. So the result is that we can actually observe uh, only the subsurface scattering on its own. And if you radiometrically calibrate your cameras, which is something that fortunately we knew how to do at the time, um, if you take the difference between the diffuse only or the subsurface only image and the specular image, you can get an image of only the specular reflection just on its own uh, from just two photographs. So our thought was, well, let's try to take some photos of just the specular light on the face and try to figure out what the shape of the face is from that. The problem with doing it with just a single light is that you only see specular reflections for certain areas of the face. Uh, in this case here, you know, on one cheek but not the other cheek. And what we really want to know is the specular illumination coming from the entire face at the same time. So as it turns out, we have devices in our lab that can illuminate a face from all the directions that light can come from at the same time. This is our light stage five device, which was just for faces, otherwise similar uh, in a lot of ways to light stage six. And we asked ourselves, could we cross-polarize out the entire sphere of illumination at the same time? Uh, and as it turns out, um, first empirically and then actually figuring this out, there's a specific pattern of linear polarizers you can put on every single light of the stage such that the specular reflection from every possible surface normal will end up with the same orientation of polarization by the time it gets to a camera in the front. And it looks like this, basically. There's kind of a bit of a, a whirl around the Brewster angle here, and uh, otherwise they're vertical here, horizontal here. Um, the, uh, uh, it takes us about an hour or so to get all of these oriented correctly. But the result is then that we can actually light somebody from every direction of light at the same time and observe them without any specular reflection whatsoever. So here I think the video projector is uh, brightening this up a little, a little bit extra here. But this is an image of Tom, uh, who's the producer in our group, lit from the entire sphere of light with no specular reflection whatsoever. So if you are, for example, making a digital character model, this could be a very useful image to start with as your diffuse texture map because it has uh, very little effects of, a, of, a, of um, you know, specularity or variable shading, which is usually a challenge when creating characters. Now, this is with it cross-polarized out. If we rotate it the other way and have parallel polarizers, uh, then we can actually bring the specular reflection back in. And here it's definitely too bright. You can see the specular light comes in. But if we take the difference, hopefully this will show up pretty well, uh, we can get an image of just the specular reflection of the face from the entire sphere of illumination at the same time. 
Uh, this looks like a black and white image. It actually was shot in color, and since the specular light hasn't had a chance to interact with you know, your melanin or your hemoglobin, it doesn't pick up any skin color. So this does correctly look like it has basically no chromaticity to it. Uh, and as you can see, we're actually picking up a lot of the detail of the skin shape uh, and shading from this specular only channel. If you're, again, creating a digital character and you need to have your specular intensity map, this could be a very good image to use as a start for that as well. Um, so the last part of the project that we had was the idea of, let's try to do a variant of photometric stereo. This is a computer vision technique where if you light an object from different directions, analyzing the diffuse reflection, you can figure out what the surface normal is because there's going to be only one surface normal that would explain the different colors that those different light directions would produce to the camera. And what we came up with, in the specular case, you actually have to use full spherical uh, positions because the uh, specular lobe is narrow enough that you might miss it entirely if you use point sources. But we came up with a technique that uses four spherical gradient patterns, uh, full sphere, uh, a gradient of light from top to bottom, a gradient of light from front to back, a gradient of light from left to right, that essentially, if we just shoot these four images, and of course we really also have to shoot these images here of the corresponding patterns on diffuse illumination uh, in order to compute these images. But from just these images and some very simple math, essentially you take this image, you divide it by this image, and you scale it so it's between minus one and one, it reads out the reflection vector of every one of the um, uh, pixels on the face based on just the specular reflection. And then if you just tilt that halfway back toward the camera, then you have an estimate of the surface normal. So the result is that you can, um, you can also do this, of course, with uh, just the diffuse channel um, with these patterns here and figure out where the diffuse light's coming from. If you do it with just the diffuse channel, you can get a normal map that will shade an image that looks something like this. Uh, you see a little bit of detail where you've got like, you know, whiskers and such that darken the, uh, darken the image, but you don't see nearly the kind of detail that you see from the specular map. So this is actually shaded with a normal map that's gotten from just the specular component, and you can see it actually picks up all of these fine wrinkle details and all the skin pore detail. And the final thing that we needed to do was to figure out a way to actually apply this kind of map, I'm going to skip over a couple slides here, uh, to some geometry. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, there's some techniques out there. We'd experimented uh, with them in our group in uh, about 2001, where if you start with a low-resolution face scan that you do get from a laser scanner, it doesn't have skin pore detail in it, and then you know what the surface normal map should be for that geometry, you can essentially emboss that surface normal map onto the geometric model and then put that kind of skin pore and fine wrinkle detail onto your 3D geometry. The nice thing about it is that we not only can get this high-res geometry, but we have perfectly aligned texture maps for the diffuse component, the specular intensity component, and such, and we can map those onto the face as well. Um, another thing that we realized, and again, I apologize, it's a little blown out on the video projector here, but this is actually a real-time rendering, just using our diffuse map and our specular maps. Um, since we get surface normal maps for both the specular component and the diffuse component, we can actually render those two components of the face with their corresponding surface normal maps. And the diffuse component's normal map is actually going to have less surface normal variation than the specular component because of the fact that the light is scattered and it effectively blurs where the light is reflecting from and it has less to do with the surface shape of the skin than what's going on underneath the skin. So as it turns out, if you render with these hybrid normal maps and you have this smoother normal map for the diffuse and a sharper normal map for the specular, it actually gives you a first order approximation to the correct subsurface scattering behavior of what the skin is doing and in a, just a local shading model. Uh, it won't get you um, light bleeding into shadow regions or the ears glowing when they're lit from behind, uh, but for you know, the convex areas of the face, uh, it gives you a very close approximation to how it will look with the full subsurface scattering uh, from uh, um, uh, full-on illumination conditions. You can also take the model and show it uh, with a subsurface scattering rendering as well, rendering just from the specular map and then using a subsurface scattering, uh, such as this is the Jensen and Bueller 2002 technique, uh, to get very nice renderings as well. Uh, one of our data sets, we uh, got interested in trying to get um, the... Uh, data of a person's hand. So this is uh, Hideshi Yamada's hand that uh, he put up in our light stage. You can see we got the uh, details of sort of the, um, uh, you know, pretty fine skin wrinkles and such. Uh, if we render it with the hybrid normal maps, we can get a pretty nice rendering there with a the specular component. In this case here, the subsurface scattering rendering 
was uh, particularly compelling because it gets that skin color bleed into the shadows here and into the shadow here, and that really also helps sell it uh, quite a bit as well. So we've gotten excited about the fact that with this photometric only technique, that as it turns out, it requires eight photographs for the spherical illumination conditions, and then just five photographs for doing a structured light scan at the end. In this small number of photographs, we can get very high resolution geometry and registered, uh, calibrated uh, texture maps for diffuse and specular in these normal maps uh, that uh, it seems like a good way to capture faces. And we've started to capture faces in different expressions, which we think we can use to drive digital actor models. Uh, and we're also looking at taking a variant of this and running it in real time, shooting it with even not all that high speed photography. We think we can shoot this kind of data set or close to it uh, at frame rate and capture it for actors' performances. So that's some of the directions that the work is continuing. So I think I have five more minutes, and I have one more thing that I could uh, talk about, which is on a little bit of a different topic. But if we can play the video, I'll, I'll try to tie it into what we've been talking about before. This is a project we did uh, in collaboration with uh, Mark Volus, who's at the USC School of Cinematic Arts, and Ian McDowell from Fake Space Labs, which is near here, uh, Hideshi Yamada from Sony, you saw his hand just a while ago, uh, and Andrew Jones was the lead author from our research group. And it was an uh, idea to use some high speed video projection techniques uh, that we've been using for doing real-time structured light scanning of faces and trying to adapt it into becoming a 3D display. And the kind of 3D display, we showed this at SIGGRAPH this last summer, um, the idea was let's make a 3D display that uh, doesn't necessarily have a terribly large image. In fact, it's a pretty small image. It's about five inches tall right here. People are peering into it. Um, but one that you can see from any direction all the way around and does not require 3D glasses. So uh, you can see here, this is actually um, a lot of our uh, friends from the, uh, the software department at Digital Domain who came for a visit. Uh, I think we have about 11 people around the display here. Uh, and they're all getting their own individual 3D view of the scene uh, from all these different angles. And the basic way that this works is that we have a video projector on top that projects imagery down onto a spinning mirror that's at 45 degrees. And the mirror is spinning around the y-axis so that it kicks the light, the image from the video projector, out to all different directions around it uh, relatively quickly. We spin the mirror about 15 to 20 frames uh, per second. So it is a little bit stroby, but it's fast enough that you can enjoy the 3D. The next versions will be 30 to 40 frames per second. Um, and um, the uh, video projector is projecting onto the mirror fast enough so that in this 15th of a second that it takes to do a rotation, we actually get an individual image for every degree and a quarter all the way around the circle. So that's 288 images at 15 uh, times per second. You'll find out from that that we actually have to project imagery onto this mirror at four to 5,000 frames per second. We have a question. What projector can we use? This actually started its life as a uh, 2,000 lumen Optoma DLP uh, projector. And uh, it got uh, seriously hot wired. Uh, in order to make it play uh, these, uh, this imagery as quickly as it does. Uh, and the technique that we used for that actually uh, takes advantage of DVI. We decided, you know, for these first versions, let's not worry about color. We took the color filter wheel out of the projector. Let's not worry about gray levels for the moment. Let's just go for binary images, show some nice wireframes and stuff. Uh, and what we are doing is we're actually rendering uh, imagery out of an NVIDIA graphics card that's encoded like this. Normally you send 24-bit color images over your DVI. Uh, what we're doing is we're sending 24 one-bit images with different views of the scene. Um, so this is uh, our, our model here. These are 24 uh, different views, each a degree and a quarter spaced around. Uh, and they're all packed into one 24-bit color image. So we actually send these to the uh, projector. We render them just by setting uh, uh, the bit, the bit uh, pattern uh, to the projector. And then we, um, uh, the projector automatically plays each image as a 24-frame movie. If we set the refresh rate of the card up to about 180 hertz, um, or even higher than that, it doesn't really start to flake out until about 240 hertz. But then we can actually get these four to 5,000 frame per second um, uh, movies. And the digital micromirror devices, the DMD uh, TI chip uh, mirrors, have no problem with any of this. When they're showing color, they're usually going around 9,000 uh, flips per second or, or, or more. So I have a video that shows basically how this works here. This is the mirror before it spins up. 
The mirror has an anisotropic diffuser on it, so when the light hits it, it gets spread out vertically and a little bit horizontally, but this makes it so you can see it even if you're a little above or below. Uh, we don't get vertical parallax naturally with this device. It's a horizontal parallax only display, but it uh, gives us a chance to um, uh, get views out to everyone. Um, and um, this actually does mean it's a little bit more of a complicated story figuring out how to project imagery onto the display. Uh, we actually are running a custom vertex shader to render somewhat multiple center of projection images out there so that when this anisotropic diffuser kind of re-bins it out into space, you end up seeing correct perspective. Uh, and that's, you know, sort of what section three of the paper is all about. But um, if we actually get this spinning up in concert with the video projector, here it goes, we get a three-dimensional scene on there. And this is just me shooting handheld walking around Now, one of the nice qualities of this is that since we're sending completely independent images out in all directions, we have no problem uh, getting occlusion in this display. Some other kinds of volumetric displays have a nice three-dimensional image, but it's kind of this ghostly, all light is uh, lit up, space is lit up, and you can see things through other things. Here, when we're looking at the back of the head, we don't see the face anymore um, because you know, what you see from the other side really doesn't have anything to do with what you're seeing from the back side. We're just rendering these out um, of the graphics card. And the other cool thing is that since graphics cards are so fast, this is about a two or 3,000 polygon model, we can actually render that at 5,000 frames per second uh, on the graphics card natively. So, that can let us make this an interactive display. This is Andrew Jones with a Paul Hemus device actually interactively uh, moving the um, uh, model around because it's live off the NVIDIA card. We did one experiment where we used the tracker uh, to actually track the, just the vertical position of where the camera was and then had the NVIDIA card um, interactively adjust the vertical viewpoint so we could sort of simulate vertical parallax. So this is with a tracked camera and we can make it so you see it from above when you actually go above there. Um, as you can see, so far this is black and white. Uh, we made one slightly desperate attempt at color, uh, which was this uh, tent mirror where we actually uh, had uh, two faces uh, there, one that we kind of split the spectrum down the middle and we had one that was sort of orangish and one that was kind of bluish. And the idea is that as the mirror turns around, we can do a, um, a thing. Uh-oh, we have a connection successful. Hi there, I guess I might have called myself here. Um, and there we go, and we're right back to the video, thank you. Um, so we spun this thing around, and by doing two channels of light, we got at least a two-channel color uh, that we had. Now the right way to do this is really to use a three-chip DLP uh, and just put you know, red, green, and blue light down onto the thing. Uh, we're talking to Texas Instruments, and they seem kind of interested in our project, so maybe uh, this year we'll have something uh, like that. The other cool thing was that when we had the tent mirror, for the stuff that was whitish, it actually gave us um, two displays of the image for every rotation. So this became a, a much more stable image going at 30 to 40 frames per second. Two more examples, one is which we got interested in trying to show not just wireframe imagery, but maybe photographically acquired imagery. So going back to this light field concept, we shot a light field of this uh, tourist souvenir that one of our folks brought back, and we uh, dithered it using uh, Viktor Ostromakov's uh, dithering algorithm and loaded up the entire NVIDIA graphics card memory with different views of this. And we're actually doing live rebinning of this uh, image uh, here um, according to vertical tracking and then we're putting the light field back out into space. So this is the real object sitting next to the virtual version of that. And that started looking pretty cool. And we realized that the fact that we've only got black and white pixels isn't so bad because the little bit of blur that you get from the motion blur uh, and the diffuser kind of starts to make it look like pretty good gray levels. Um, and we liked that so much we thought what we really need to try to do is do something that actually like, you know, kind of is animated and moves. And we wondered, is there some kind of photographic data set that we can shoot from all directions of something that's moving? Um, and uh, we realized that actually we had that kind of data set. So calling Bruce back into service here, we uh, got our light stage six data set of Bruce, rebinned it onto the display, and then we're able to uh, sort of do a, thank you. So uh, not, not uh, Princess Leia yet, but uh, maybe we're getting there. Very cool. All right, well that's all I brought today. We thank everyone here. There's some uh, websites with all the videos. Thank you very much. 
and if there's time for any questions, I think they're going to do another talk in here right away, but I'm happy to answer questions as long as there's time. Yes? You know, okay, so one of the members of our computer animation festival jury was Randall Kleiser, uh, who I'm sure you know. He's a film director. Uh, and when he showed it to it, we showed it to the whole jury uh, when they were choosing the films. He said, have you ever thought of doing, you know, Princess Leia on this? He says, I know Carrie Fisher. I mean, I'm sure she'd be into it. And at that point, I thought, A, that would be incredibly cool. B, I'm so sure she would not be into it. <laughs> so, but we'll see. Maybe, maybe, it'll, maybe it'll happen. I, I hope maybe someday we can at least demonstrate it for her. That would be cool enough. Okay. Thank you very much.